Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Voilà. So uh, it's a great pleasure, and in fact, uh, an honor for me to introduce our next keynote speaker, Lawrence Mondada, who is currently full professor of French and general linguistics at the University of Basel in Switzerland. Lorenzo is a world-leading expert in the field of linguistics who has published widely on the interrelationship of language, embodiment, space, and mobility. Her research deals with the analysis of social interaction in ordinary, professional, and institutional settings within an ethnomethodological and conversation analytic perspective. She, her work focuses on how the organization of social interaction draws on a diversity of multimodal resources, such as, besides language, gesture, gaze, body posture, movements, object manipulation, as well as multisensorial practices, such as touching, tasting, smelling, and seeing. Uh, I first met Lorenza at the International Pragmatics Conference in Budapest in July uh, 2000. At that time, I was working here in Lyon, and uh, Lorenza told me that she'd just been nominated uh, professor in the same linguistics department where I worked. Uh, goodness me, I thought, she looks so young, and still does, to be nominated full professor. She must be very brilliant. And of course, I was completely right. Uh, I also have uh, quite fond memories of a project um, that we both worked on, on studying how architects work together in groups. And I remember very well our uh, passionate debates on the nature of categories in interaction and analysis. So I'd just advise anyone here, if you want to take on Lorenza in an intellectual debate, you'd better be very, very well prepared. Uh, after directing the ICAR CNRS Research Lab here at the Ernest Lyon, Lorenza took up her current professorship in Basel 10 years later. In 2012, Lawrence has received many academic prizes, awards, and honorary degrees, and I'm sure that process is far from ended. To mention just a few, in 2001, she was awarded the National Latsis Prize, a prize awarded in Switzerland to the top researcher under 40. She's awarded in 2013 a honorary doctorate from uh, the University of Southern Denmark. Uh, same thing from the University of Linköping in Sweden. Uh, she's also been a dis Finland Distinguished Professor uh, funded by the Acad Academy of Finland. Uh, Lorenz's keynote presentation today is entitled, well, it's written here, but I'll say it anyway, Negotiating Knowledge, Expertise, Connoisseurship, and Taste in, in Social Interaction. So, Welcome back to Lyon, Lorenza, and over to you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to be back in Lyon and to be able to do this, uh, this talk. So thank you, Chris, uh, for inviting me. Um, I will... Uh, focus my talk on uh, uh, various ways in which uh, we can work on uh, knowledge. Um, knowledge is absolutely central in a variety of settings, from school to work to everyday uh, life, especially in a so-called knowledge society. Uh, I'm interested in looking at how these issues of, uh, of knowledge um, how they are dealt with in situated, practical, commonsensical, and also sensorial ways within ordinary actions. So what I will um, propose here uh, is a praxeological, intersubjective, and embodied view on, uh, on knowledge. A praxeological view that means uh, knowledge seen not an abstract, not something that is in the brain, not something that is in the books, but something that emerges, is achieved, is recognized within social actions. And action will be the very focus of uh, my analysis. Another important point is uh, that my 
approach of knowledge considers it as intersubjective. So knowledge is not something that is in the mind of the individual, um, but something that is publicly established, negotiated, contested in different forms of social interaction. And finally, I'm interested in the way in which knowledge is manifested through language, but not only through language. Uh, I'm interested in, way, in, in ways in which gestures, postures, and body movement feature in uh, the construction and negotiation of knowledge. So what I will do in the next hour or so is um, looking at how knowledge is claimed, debated, built, acknowledged in situ, in an institutional setting that is characterized by asymmetries of knowledge and where knowledge uh, matters uh, for uh, the various participants. Um, the starting point of, uh, of this analysis is uh, the study of knowledge in talking interaction. Um, first of all, uh, there are tons of uh, books uh, by my colleagues in linguistics looking at uh, the linguistic markers of epistemic stances as well as the, what, what they call the evidential markers. So things like, I guess, it looks like, or maybe, or the use of the conditional mode, or the use of various particles uh, can demonstrate the kind of uh, modal uh, uh, epistemic stance that somebody uh, takes on, uh, on things. In some languages, uh, for example here, the Arawak from uh, northern Brazil, uh, we have a morphology that uh, uh, plays this, this role of uh, uh, saying what kind of epistemic stance the speaker is taking. So, for example, the morpheme ka will, will mean we saw it, but ma ka will mean we heard it, uh, pida ka will mean we, we were told, etc. That is, uh, you have a morphology that marks the kind of uh, uh, epistemic uh, value uh, that, uh, um, that, that what you are saying uh, has for, uh, for you. So language is very rich in uh, marking this thing, these things, but what is um, particular in the, in the kind of approach that I uh, try to um, adopt, uh, inspired by conversation analysis and ethnomethodology, is the focus on action. That is, um, knowledge is expressed in terms of talk and within uh, courses of action. Uh, in this sense, is not just an hidden individual mental cognitive process. And here I follow the uh, invitation of um, Jeff Coulter uh, in the 80s already saying, treat the mental properties of persons as generated from situated constitutive practices. And action for me is not only the action of individual actors, it is action in interaction. So what interests me is to look at how epistemic positionings are constantly calibrated and recalibrated within social interaction among uh, different uh, co-participants. Uh, so I will look at expression of knowledge as they are embedded in sequential context and related to specific actions addressed to specific interlocutors and negotiated in their responses. Another thing that interests me, uh, and actually on what I am currently working, is um, not only to have a linguistic and discursive take on knowledge, but also to take seriously embodied uh, knowledge. Uh, and here I uh, currently work on corporeal experiences, uh, issues of taste and sensoriality. So the idea, the basic idea is that knowledge is not reductible to discourse or to information. There are various sources of knowledge and these sources, among these sources, there are perception uh, of the material world. I will come back to that with a focus on taste. Um, this, of course, uh, um, builds on a long, um, long, I think, tradition uh, critical of the dualism of mind uh, and, uh, and the body. And here, uh, among many, many others who I, can, I could uh, quote, I refer to Ryle in 49, saying, focus on the scholar at his desk rather than his mind behind him. 
Um, and Ryle precisely introduced this opposition, this distinction between knowing that, that is propositional knowledge, and knowing how, practical uh, knowledge, showing that if you are interested in knowing how, you will be obligated to look at it uh, as it is embedded in courses of action. So to take an example from Ryle, knowing to operate on a patient is not demonstrated by the surgeon by uttering some medical truth, but by the way in which his hands make the correct movements. And this, in a way, connects also to the idea of tacit uh, knowledge uh, of Polanyi, and I was happy to find that uh, he was uh, referring to, uh, to taste while uh, speaking of connoisseurship. Connoisseurship like skill can be communicated only by example, not by percept. To become an expert wine taster, to acquire knowledge of innumerable different blends of tea, you must go through a long course of experience under the guidance of the master. So I'm interested in trying to analyze this uh, experience. Um, I do that by looking at a very specific setting, and I hope to uh, show you that it's worth uh, concentrating on a specific setting, which, is, uh, which are food shops. I'm interested in gourmet food shops. It's a very nice way to do field work, I can tell you. <laughs> um, so why food shops? Food shops are uh, a, a place where uh, knowledge features and matters, uh, you will say, in different ways. Um, it matters uh, in relation to uh, new consumption practices in the new global economy, um, targeting traditional but also new and expensive products, and also including environmental and, and ethical concerns, which can generate uh, some interesting argumentative uh, discussions. But more interestingly, uh, uh, maybe uh, food shops are a place where social order is constantly elaborated and re-elaborated, and where issues uh, like uh, distinction at, à, la, à la Bourdieu are constantly uh, uh, at uh, at stake. So gourmet food is a place where social identities, like the identities of hipsters, amateurs, connoisseurs, gourmet, are constantly built and sometimes uh, destroyed. Uh, so, um, uh, food shops are a place where norms related to culture, to health, uh, also to desire, are uh, omnipresent. They are places of culture where issues of terroir, of authenticity, of heritage, of history are omnipresent. And they are places of socialization, and I thought that this could be interesting uh, for you uh, in order to reflect at uh, food shops uh, as places where people constantly learn uh, things about uh, uh, sophistications related to, uh, to food. Um, so you have many layers of knowledge and, uh, and taste uh, in, these, uh, in these kind of settings. I'm more, interesting, more interested in, or more particularly interested in uh, cheese shops. So cheese shops are fascinating because imagine you enter a shop and you have between 100 and 300 different cheeses to choose from. Imagine how you navigate in these kind of waters. Uh, and you, you see that immediately the problem of uh, the knowledge that you have uh, in order to just be able to utter a request is, uh, is, quite, uh, is quite fundamental. So you have issues of culture, of geography, of history, of traditional knowledge, but also of new, trendy, fashionable uh, gastronomic interests. Uh, you have issues of norms. What is the good composition of a plateau? Uh, how you organize your wine pairings. Um, you have taste, and I will show that taste is not only Bourdieu's idea of distinction, but it's actually sensorial experiences that you can do in these places. And you have issues of socializations. You have lots of novices learning something about cheeses, uh, and you have also knowledgeable uh, customers uh, who uh, try to display uh, how expert they, uh, they are. So I will try to show you that this is, uh, after all, not such, uh, not, it, it, it can seem anecdotical, but it 
in this place that enables uh, some kind of uh, systematic analysis of uh, the issues that interest me. So I will, uh, I will navigate between uh, issues of socialization and situated learning, issues of expertise and taste. Um, the, the, the idea of socialization that is very present uh, uh, in a way in, this, uh, in these settings um, connects to an interest uh, for uh, informal ordinary contingent situations where people, uh, people learn. Uh, we have witnessed in the literature, in the literature a, a, a move from the classroom to the workplace, but also to uh, everyday situations uh, in which uh, people happen to, uh, to learn uh, within various communities of, uh, of practices. There has been uh, a, an increasing interest for uh, informal learning um, within, for example, what Guy uh, calls affinity uh, spaces. And of course, this connects also to the interactional approaches that uh, we can find, for example, in conversational analysis about uh, how learning uh, is uh, organized in different, uh, in different settings and is also endogenously defined as, uh, as it happens. So socialization and situated learning is one aspect. The other aspect is the very fact that uh, food is not only related to expertise uh, in the sense of uh, or traditional propositional knowledge uh, that has been quite well uh, analyzed within uh, conversation analysis in these last uh, years, but rises at other, other issues which are more related to uh, how embodiment features in uh, epistemic and sensorial uh, experiences. And gourmet shops are a place where to observe this tension between expert discourse and sensorial experiences. And I will try to show you that. Um, on the basis of a variety of data that um, include uh, posh uh, shops, like here in Madrid, um, less or more traditional shops, like here in Germany. Uh, this one is uh, the shop where Gilbert and George are going in London. Um, this one is a traditional shop in Basel. Uh, this one in Paris that you will see in, in my data, and this one in a market uh, in, uh, in Helsinki. I have a variety of, uh, uh, of data that I have collected in 15 cities in, uh, in Europe uh, covering 12 different languages. And here my, my, my aim is not to show you any distinction or difference between languages, but rather to show you that we find very similar things ac across, uh, across languages. Uh, the methodology I use is um, what uh, we, call, we can call multimodal conversation analysis. It is uh, built on ethnomethodology, on conversation analysis, and on video analysis. Important for us today, it, it is that it focuses on actions, on their format, how these actions are formatted verbally, but also uh, in an embodied way. And uh, it focuses also in how these actions feature in sequence organization. For example, we constantly ask the question, what is, what is the prior action? What are the next actions? Or what is the first action? What is the second action? What is the action that initiates something? What is the action that responds uh, to, uh, to it? And we consider in this approach that actions are formatted in such a way that makes them accountable, that is intelligible for others. So. Uh, uh, in, in these sequential environments, uh, the issue of understanding each other, the issue of intersubjectivity is uh, absolutely uh, central. The analytical focus, as I said, is action. And I will be interested in uh, how knowledge is attributed, claimed, and recognized by participants in specific types of, uh, of actions. So I'm, I'm interested in looking at how participants participants manifest that knowledge is relevant. Uh, I don't believe that it is always relevant, but you will see that in these settings it is indeed uh, relevant. And not only it is relevant, but it is consequential for 
formatting actions and formatting actions in response to these uh, actions. And in this interplay of actions, uh, I am able, uh, I think, to capture the participant's perspective uh, on, uh, on, on that. I will uh, organize my analysis uh, around uh, apparently easy uh, things like explicit claims of knowledge, the customer saying, I know this, or saying, I don't know this, I have no idea about this, um, and then moving to implicit displays of knowledge, for example, in actions like asking a question. If you ask a question, you uh, display that you don't know the answer. Uh, this, the classroom is the only strange setting where you ask questions knowing the answer, but in real life, this is not the case. So we will see people asking real questions about the cheeses that they might uh, buy. And I will look at uh, so these claims and these displays. Uh, I will look at them uh, for expressions of uh, lack of knowledge to begin with, then for expressions of uh, um, knowledge, claims uh, of having knowledge, and I will then move from knowledge to uh, taste when uh, people engage in taste, and I will show what the difference uh, uh, tasting makes. So I begin with uh, customers um, uh, claiming and displaying that they don't know. In this case, uh, this tends to correspond to an asymmetry between customers and salespersons, where uh, the customer doesn't know and the salesperson is supposed uh, to, uh, to know. There are interesting issues related to uh, um, uh, claims of knowledge and displays of knowledge and, and social categories on which I will, uh, I will come, uh, come back. Important uh, sequentially is uh, the fact that adopting a K minus, so uh, lack of knowledge position, invites for an expansion of uh, the, uh, the, the, the sequence. So if some, somebody doesn't, if somebody says, I don't know, uh, what uh, happens next is that he or she gets some kind of explanation. And this is, uh, this is visible in this case. You have uh, this guy who is buying cheese, this is the seller, and this guy is looking at some strange cheese here. You have the image here. Uh, this is actually an um, Irish porter cheese. Uh, it's a cheddar which has been curated with Guinness. It's one, it's one of these fancy cheeses that you find nowadays, even in Paris. Here we are in Paris. The guy looks at the cheese and he says, je connais pas ça, I don't know uh, this. And what he gets is an explanation by uh, the, um, the seller. Alors ça c'est un cheddar jeune qui va être affiné avec de la Guinness. C'est beaucoup plus doux que, ouais. euh, que ce qu'on pourrait croire. Quand on le voit, ça fait un peu impressionnant, euh, sombre. Et ça en fait, fait en termes de euh... Un petit peu, ouais. Je peux vous faire goûter si vous voulez. Ouais. Mais vous allez voir. Vous allez... So it ends up offering to taste, and we understand that the seller is not enthusiastic about the cheese, but this is another story. Uh, what interests me is uh, the fact that je connais pas ça generates an explanation. And this explanation uh, includes the name of the cheese, uh, includes the way in which the cheese is curated, is fabricated, and it includes some reference uh, to, uh, uh, to, the, to the ingredients, uh, but also to, uh, to the taste. And it's interesting that when they begin to discuss about the, ta the, 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 the uh, the tasting features, uh, um, the explanation is not enough. I will come back in the last part of my talk. The explanation is not enough, and what happens is that uh, an offer to taste is, uh, is produced. But you see that basically, I don't know, uh, generates an explanation. Uh, you have the same thing here. Uh, here I show you first the, uh, the transcription and then I will show you the, the, the expert. The, excerpt. the seller says, offers an extra, makes a proposal. Uh, we have the beau jus. Um, and the clients, uh, we, we have here uh, a couple. The client says, 
I don't know too much. The too much is, is interesting. There is a graduality of, uh, of knowledge. The husband says, je connais pas trop, and, the, and the, the wife, more interestingly, says, even me, even me, I don't know whether I ever tasted that. Even me, it's interesting because then she elaborates by saying, although I am here since a while ago, since always, actually, she was born there. Uh, this, is, this, is quite, this is quite interesting because it shows that uh, this even me shows that if you are born in a place and you are asking for a cheese that comes from that place, you are supposed to know it. So there is a relation between identity and uh, um, uh, identity and, uh, and knowledge. What happens also is that uh, whereas in the first case the cheddar was explained as a very strange and exotic uh, kind of thing, unknown, here le beau jus is explained in a way that supposes that the client knows quite a bunch of things about cheese and about local cheese. The Bouju is the producer of Abondance, who makes it for us. If I tell you that, probably it will not speak to the, most, uh, the majority of, uh, uh, of you. Um, and, um, and the seller goes on, we can say it's a cheese which is between a Comté and a Beaufort. So you see that this way of explaining, of quoting other cheeses, of positioning the cheese within other cheeses, uh, uh, supposes actually a lot of knowledge uh, on the side of uh, the, um, uh, the client. And the knowledge she supposes is uh, attributed on the basis of this claim of uh, identity. I show you the excerpt. Ensuite, on a le beau jus. Bah, le beau jus, on va vous en prendre parce que... Mais moi, ouais, je même moi, pas trop. Ouais, même moi, je ne sais même pas si j'ai goûté ça. Ouais. Bah, ouais. Pourtant, pourtant, je suis là depuis un moment. Pas depuis toujours, en fait. C'est le fabricant d'abondance qui nous le fait. D'accord. Alors, on va dire que c'est un fromage qui est en train de compter et un beau fort. D'accord. Ah, ouais, ça, ça semble pas mal euh, voilà. à l'oreille. D'accord. And then she gives, uh, she gives to, to, uh, to taste. You see that when the, the seller says it's between a Comté and a Beaufort, the other, the other person says, oh yeah, looks, looks good, looks, he, it, it, it sounds good. Uh, so she recognizes uh, these kind of, uh, of references. So this is a, a nice case of uh, showing the, the relevance of personal identities for claims of knowledge. And there is this, this nice, a uh, uh, concept that Sharrock uh, proposes of owning knowledge, certain categories, certain uh, identity categories own uh, knowledge. Uh, um, and this is, uh, this is taken into, uh, into consideration. It is also taken into consideration, for example, when people uh, have to account for not knowing, like in a Spanish shop selling Spanish cheese, uh, the guy saying, es que no vivo en España? I don't live here as a way of disclosing some form of personal identity in order to account for him not knowing uh, a, certain, uh, a certain cheese. Um, now, another, another way, these, these, these were, were uh, examples where the, the, the clients were, ex were exhibiting claiming not knowing in a very explicit way. Now, when they ask a question, they display that they don't know. For example, here we have a client in Paris uh, asking Le Dôme de Vesle, which taste is it? And what he gets is exactly what we got in the, uh, in the cheddar case, um, an explanation, which is almost a lecture about the Dôme de Vesle. It is a bit fresher, it's a goat, so the animal coming from Bourgogne, the place, very important, um, and then the, the type of rind, uh, the type of, uh, uh, of, uh, of texture. So the question generates an explanation. Um, here we, uh, we have another, another uh, example. Uh, the client says, uh, what it is this like? You have the name, sell sur cher. Uh, you have uh, the lecturing. So it's a typical French quote from Patou Charente, geography. Uh, animal uh, and then uh, the uh, the texture here too 
he ends up giving to taste, and I will come back uh, to, uh, to that. So questions generate uh, explanations. Now, there are other ways of uh, solving the problem of how to ask for a cheese without knowing uh, anything about the cheese, and it is to do a request with a, a demonstrative or with a deictic element, like, uh, I would like this one. And this generally is done uh, so with uh, deictic elements like localizations or demonstratives, and it is typically done by looking at the cheese and by pointing at, uh, uh, at it. You have a series of examples here from Madrid, uh, but I have the same phenomena in other places. Uh, things like, también de este medio, por favor, uh, cien gramillos de este, and you have always the uh, demonstrative, which is uh, pointed at here. Me voy a llevar otro trocito de este. Mira este trozo me pones. So este, uh, the demonstrative, and uh, typically trocito, trozo, uh, which is uh, a, a bit. Uh, so a very vague way of referring to cheese, displaying that the person doesn't know. The response to that is pretty systematic, and uh, in second position, the seller gives the name. Afuegal Pitu, Conte, Parmigiano, Civita. What is interesting here is that he doesn't just say, this is a Civita, which will be the kind of imposing K plus uh, way of doing. What he does is that he proposes the, the, the name with an interrogative prosody. Afuegal Pitu? Conte, Parmigiano, and what this interrogative prosody generates is a new slot where the, the, the client can say yes. It's very simple to say yes, but by doing that, what is kind of nice is that the seller gives the client the opportunity to confirm what she or he wants, and in this way, uh, uh, gives the opportunity to the client to have some kind of, uh, of control on the, uh, on the sequence. Um, now, uh, I am interested in, uh, in cases, and I have to accelerate, uh, I, have in, I, I, have, I am interested in cases not only in which people don't know, but in which people don't know but end up knowing. Um, that is in uh, re, uh, reorganizations of, uh, the, uh, of the distribution of, uh, uh, of knowledge. Um, here, uh, this, old, this old lady asks for a malicorn. She, she sees in the window uh, a, a malicorn and she says, uh, there is the malicorn that I don't know. I didn't know that they, mo they do goat cheese in the Sartre. And this, this uh, turn is very interesting because she says that she doesn't know, but by adding, I didn't know that they make goat in the Sartre, she is actually displaying that she knows something uh, about uh, the place. She infers Sartre, which is a region from Malicorn, which is like often the name of the cheese is also the name of, uh, uh, of the place. What is interesting is that here the salesperson um, displays uh, that this is not the right thing for her to say. She corrects, she says it's not Sart, it's Poitou Charente. Um, and interestingly at that point the old lady says Malicorne de Sart, it's rather Poitou than Charente. So what she does is that she not only resists but she corrects the correction. And the result is that the salesperson will say Ah, for you, Malicorn, it's, the client will say, it's in the Sartre for me, and you see that here there is a restriction to personal knowledge and not to general knowledge. Uh, but then the salesperson says, ah, it's the name of a village, yes, and you have, in 15, a very interesting uh, uh, instance of claiming not knowing. Ah, je savais même pas, vous voyez. I didn't, I didn't even know uh, that. So you, you, you start from the client saying, I don't know, and uh, you end up uh, a few lines after in the salesperson saying uh, that she doesn't, uh, she doesn't know. So those kind of uh, recalibrations uh, of knowledge are quite 
interesting uh, to, uh, to look at. And this happens also for when the customers claim and display knowing. So now I go from K minus to uh, K plus, and the clients uh, very often, no, well, um, I don't have statistics about, uh, about that, but sometimes uh, the clients say, say, claim that they know. Like uh, this client here, she says, I know a bit about cheese. I've lived in France for so many years. So you see again the displays of uh, of knowledge related to personal uh, identity and, uh, and biography. And you have things like, je suis un grand fan de Rocamadour, I am a fan of Rocamadour, or uh, I am very much of uh, cheese, uh, cheese stuff. Now, um, in, uh, in some cases, the client, and again, this old woman, a woman does, does it, she corrects the uh, salesperson about uh, the way in which she pronounced the name of a cheese. I, I skip that. Um, so the, the, uh, uh, clients can correct salespersons about what they say, but also salespersons can correct customers about what they claim to know. So claiming to know can be a dangerous thing to do. Like here the client says she has bought a Bria Savarin, and she says, you see, I know my Brie. Uh, you know, that's good. Very good laughter. A Brie is not a Bria Savarin, definitely. Okay, so you, you, know, you know that because you, you have produced the laughter. Um, now the client says, you see, I know my brie, and the salesperson, after a slight pause, goes, it's not a brie cheese, but it's a fresh cheese. It's quite similar. So here you have a correction uh, that, is, uh, that is made. The consequences of this are very visible here. You have a quite long pause, more than three seconds, and then the salesperson says, I love Copenhagen. <laughs> the, the client disclosed that she was from Copenhagen. Um, so the salesperson, by saying I love Copenhagen, orients towards the silence that followed as problematic. And she gets no response. She goes on, fantastic. No response, and then a small yo. <laughs> so you see that knowledge matters, and it can be uh, it can be violent in the cheese shop. <laughs> now, a way of showing that you know is very simple: is naming the uh, product. Like here in Finland, this woman would ask. So you, you will have a, an exchange of uh, greetings, moi moi, and then you have more beer. Yeah. That's the only thing that she says uh, in order to ask for some morbier. Yes. So you have morbier, yeah, yeah, and then the morbier gets uh, fetched. So this is the most simple way of showing that you know, and this happens all over the place. Une tête de moine, s'il vous plaît. A slice of morbier. Crutzi, a mimolette that ich gern, et cetera, et cetera, in all, the, uh, in, in all the languages. And generally, it is responded in an aligned way, first by a yes, and then by fetching uh, the cheese. Now, here too, there are interesting things when there is a disaligned response. And again, this matters uh, and shows how epistemic um, uh, problems can surface quite easily. Uh, here we are in Tonon, and unfortunately the, the, the audio is not very good, but the client says, je vais prendre le Saint-Maur. Um, and actually the seller says, le Saint-Maur. So there is here a correction. Uh, the cheese is called Saint-Maur. Uh, although it is uh, called with the uh, masculine, pron uh, the, the masculine uh, uh, article uh, here. So you have these corrections that show uh, that, you know, she perfectly understood what the, what the, what which is the, the, the customer wanted, but the correction is interesting to re-establish uh, who knows exactly, uh, exactly what. I have this case which is, which is very uh, nice but a bit long so I will skip it, but where this guy is, I can show you the beginning, he's looking, he doesn't, he doesn't know what he wants, he's looking.
Sumatra, c'est un fromage. Oui, j'en ai, ai mangé, oui. C'est okay, un peu comme de... oui. entre, ouais, entre un chaours et. So, what, what happens here? And you, you can maybe feel the little tension that there is between, uh, between them. He is looking and he's, uh, he's saying, what could I take? And in, he, he says the name of uh, a cheese, which is probably also read or readable on the, on the label. Um, and immediately the, 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 the vendor, the seller says, Le Sumatra is a cheese that blah, blah, blah. So she starts with the lecture. What is interesting here is that in overlap, and here overlaps are all over the place, in overlap, the guy says, yes, yes, I already eaten, uh, I've already eaten that cheese. Um, and the result is that she says, sorry, she apologizes. This is, this is interesting because it shows that this way of beginning, le soumetra, c'est un fromage, is immediately understood as orienting to the K-minus, uh, um, this, to, to this as a K-minus display. And by uh, stopping that in overlap, uh, and by claiming that he already got that kind of cheese, uh, uh, what the client does is that he re-establishes himself as K-plus. And the result is an, apo an apology. Again, the apology shows uh, how important, how um, decisive uh, uh, the, the, this, this epistemic calibration uh, is. So to summarize uh, the findings until, until now, it's, it's something pretty, uh, pretty systematic in a, in a way. The customer can claim or display K minus or K plus. When he claims K minus, he says, I don't know, for example. Uh, when he displays K minus, he ask a question or a request with a demonstrative plus gaze, plus pointing. When he claims uh, K plus, he just says, I know. But when he displays K plus, uh, one way of doing it is uh, requesting with name. And in this case, you have no gaze and no pointing uh, to, uh, to the cheese. So th these, these two types of requests are very clearly uh, uh, distinct. As a response, the salesperson, when she or he aligns, produces expansions um, after, for example, a question, or when there is a request for name, you have no expansions. You have just a progression toward, towards the next action within, uh, the, uh, within the sale. Interesting are uh, the disalignments where um, the customer can refuse the salesperson uh, explanation or the customer can correct uh, the salesperson. Uh, and uh, uh, when the, the customer has uh, uh, displayed K+, plus, the salesperson can correct uh, him or her. So you have in the disalignments cases in which there is a, re, um, a redefinition uh, of uh, the epistemic position of the participants. Now, uh, what I would do in the last um, couple of, uh, of minutes, and I'm, uh, I'm okay, um, is uh, showing you what happens where, uh, when the explanations, that is a case of propositional knowledge, uh, are not enough. And they uh, transit, uh, and generally they, they, they don't, uh, so salespersons do not offer to taste immediately. So these things are uh, sequentially ordered. First you have some kind of propositional knowledge that is offered, and then you have offers uh, to taste. And I will try to show you that, uh, whereas in the uh, explanations, the customer is just the recipient. Uh, uh, of course, he or she is actively listening, responding, but he uh, is a, a, a recipient, uh, and this reproduces the asymmetry between uh, salespersons and customers. In the case of tasting, the customer a, a, a acquires uh, agency, and in some cases this inverses the asymmetry, although the customer might still don't know what uh, uh, the, the, that, that object uh, is. So I'm interested in uh, the opportunities, the different opportunities that tasting offers with respect to, uh, 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 to an explanation. Um, 
To situate uh, tasting, I remind you the cheddar uh, example, uh, where the guy was saying, je connais pas. He was pointing at the, at the shelf, and the salesperson ended up saying, I can give it to taste if you want. And this, interestingly, happens after he was beginning to uh, mention some uh, sensory features of, uh, of the cheese. Um, another example uh, from, uh, from Madrid, uh, the customer asks the difference between two cheddars. Um, and the, the response is interesting because it, it begins with the, the, the history. One cheddar is done in this and this place. The other one is done by other people. Uh, one is of uh, cow. The other one uh, is done uh, with sheep. Um, uh, milk, but at some point he, he, he mentions the bitterness um, and also uh, the fact that he is a little bit doughy. And at that point he says, Mire, prebe este e prebe, e prebe, e prebe lo, el otro. So he offers to taste both uh, in order to decide, uh, to, make, to, to be able to make the difference and to decide if he wants to, uh, to buy them. So you have a pattern emerging that is. Uh, uh, the client not knowing, uh, an explanation being uh, provided, but uh, the explanation reaching some, uh, some kind of, of limits. And the next thing to do, uh, actually, is uh, to offer to taste. And offering to taste is not anymore speaking about the object, but offering to taste is offering to have a access, a direct sensorial access to, uh, uh, to, the, uh, to the object. And of course, this enables then the client to do other, other things. Um, I have an example here that I would like to show you, but I saw that I had some problems uh, with my video for a reason. HDMI is killing the sound, so I show you this. Um, uh, it's a, a person who is uh, a client who is here and who is asking uh, something about the cell share. How are you, madam? Thanks for waiting. Okay, great. She asked something share. about so this cheese. It's typical French goat yeah. from the British so it's like a, a medium about the texture, but the flavor is not very strong. Not too much, but nice flavor. Yeah. Okay. So ash around. Well, apparently the sound is not is not great, which I. Uh, but I come back. I come to my to my transcript. Um, and you will see other, uh, other examples. What happens here is the client asks, what is this like? We, show, we, we saw it uh, uh, before. And what he, he, say, he, he, he provides is the name, uh, the animal, uh, the geography, the texture. And then here I am interested in what happens in line 20. He says, so ash around, there are some ashes uh, around this, uh, this cheese, like, and then, then it stops. Here, it's, it's a nice case in which the explanation uh, has reached his, its limits in a, in a way. And maybe, maybe if you want to, to see it as a, as a way of pointing to the ineffability of, uh, of taste, you can see it that way. Uh, the, the, the talk is suspended. And instead, what we have is during something like six seconds, uh, you have the client taking the bit of cheese, putting the bit of cheese in the mouth, looking down at the, at the remaining bits uh, and uh, chewing it. Um, while the seller looks at, uh, at her. Uh, and finally, uh, the seller says, what do you think about the sales sur cher? And the client says, not quite strong. And this is very bad, actually. Uh, she will get another, uh, another stronger uh, cheese. What is interesting for me is that not quite strong is, is a judgment, is an assessment that is made possible by the tasting. Uh, she doesn't know what this cheese is. She doesn't know anything about it. At the beginning, she asks a question. She gets an answer. But now, interestingly, 
that she has tasted, the question is asked by the seller and she is able to provide for an answer. And that answer is pretty tough, uh, actually. So you see in which sense the tasting enables to reverse the kind of actions that the salesperson and the customer are, uh, are doing. In this sense also I say that uh, the tasting gives agency to, uh, the, uh, to the clients. So there is a reversion of the asymmetry between customer and sales, uh, salesperson uh, here. I give you another example where you will see the person actually tasting this, uh, this person. He has asked for, or she has proposed something that she says is a bit like a Roquefort. We can discuss about uh, this comparison, but um, that's what she gives him. We are in Finland. So she gives to taste. Look at the way in which he tastes. He almost closes his eyes, he looks down, chews in a visible and vigorous way, and then looks back at her and, 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 and repristinates talk. So if we look at what, uh, what happens, she offers this, uh, this cheese, and then uh, he, he chews it for 13 seconds, which is quite a long, a long time, in silence. And then he comes back to it's Roquefort. Actually, it's not Roquefort. So she explains that this is, this is a, a, a white rind, and uh, well, it's a red uh, rind cheese and not a white. Um, um, but then, uh, then you have line 20. What interests me is the client who says, this is good, Huva. Uh, and very interesting. And so his, the, the tasting again enables him to do an assessment and to decide that uh, in this case he wants to, uh, to buy it. Um, if we look at the way in which he tastes, and this is, this is something that I am currently uh, working on, I'm looking at uh, what happens in tasting. And what happens in tasting, I know that there are taste buds, I know that there are neurotransmitters that transmit the taste from the taste buds to the, to the brain, but what I'm interested in are those silence and what people do during this silence. And what people do during this silence is that the seller might look or not look at the client. Towards the end of the, the, the tasting, she definitely looks at him and he looks back at her. But during the tasting proper, what you have is a, is a very vigorous chewing, it's not just eating, it's something that you see, the, you have seen, you have seen the, 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 the articulation of the, of the mouth. Uh, so you have a kind of visible chewing um, and you have also uh, the fact that he looks away. They systematically look away uh, when, they, uh, when they chew in this, uh, in this way, and that's only when they gaze back at the seller and the seller gaze back at them, so they reestablish mutual gaze, that you have something that is then uh, some talk uh, or some outcome that is, uh, that is produced. So, Tasting is something that promotes the customer's agentivity in a very specific way and in a way that is, is not agentivity just in general, is, is agentivity that is visible in the embodiment of the, of the customer. The customer disengages from talk with the salesperson, he goes, he, he gaze away, and by the way we have seen that the salesperson herself can or himself can suspend the talk while this, uh, this happens. The customer engages in tasting, uh, and he engages in tasting in a very visual uh, way. Visual way means that this is publicly witnessable by uh, the other person, that is the, sell, the salesperson, and then re-engages in talk with the sales, uh, the sale uh, person. So tasting is produced as an embodied action that is um, uh, that is visible for uh, for the other. In this sense, it is individual because it is retracting from uh, interacting with, uh, uh, talking rather, uh, with the salesperson, but it's not individual, it's not private. It is public uh, and it is witnessable. And by the way, the salespersons look at the face in order to understand if he's 
uh, liking or disliking. Uh, the cheese, if he likes, he will buy it. If he dislikes, he will not buy it. So there is a, a practical consequence uh, to, uh, to that. What is interesting is that tasting is the sensorial ground that warrants the production of an autonomous uh, judgment. So we can say that in this sense, tasting is a social and intersubjective uh, action and not just a physiological sensorial uh, uh, process. I'm interested in, in cases which I will skip because I'm getting uh, at the end of my, my time. I'm interested in, in cases in which tasting is not happening in silence, but it is guided by uh, the salespersons. And in some cases, uh, this is quite interesting because it is what I would call a case of instructed tasting. Sometimes it produces some... Uh, understanding by the client, but I demonstrate in this example that sometimes it just kills uh, the possibility of, uh, uh, of tasting. And this will be for our next, uh, our next time, because I will uh, just uh, summarize. I, I, I hope that you, you have seen the, this, this contrast between uh, uh, explaining, giving information about, um, uh, about an object and actually accessing that, uh, that object. In the two cases, the next action that is uh, possible to produce uh, is, very, uh, is very different. Um, what I, I, I try to, to show you in, with these, these variations of, uh, of cases is uh, at the same time the variability. You see that it's not that the client always is K minus, he can be K minus, he can be K plus, and he can go from a, from a K plus claim into a correction that basically makes him or her K, uh, K minus. Uh, uh, inversely and in the, same, in the same way, the salesperson who generally starts from uh, having an action explaining, which is a typical K plus action, can become a K minus uh, 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 participant when uh, she or he is corrected by, uh, by the customer. So this shows that knowledge is manifested and attributed in a negotiated way. And this, this way, when, when, when I speak of negotiation, is really these uh, very small adjustments that are done moment by moment, and, there, and, that, and that can constantly change. That's the fascinating uh, uh, aspect when you look at, uh, at, these, de uh, at these details. Um, I think I showed also that um, you, you have here different epistemic categories and identities that are surfacing in, uh, in, these, uh, in these situations, where you have epistemic asymmetries that can go uh, in parallel or hand in hand with institutional asymmetries, but also these can be recalibrated in, uh, in situ. You can have professional expertise, which is confronted to amateur connoisseurship. And the uh, professional expertise is normatively organized. Uh, you have uh, geography, uh, biology, production techniques, types of textures that can be uh, produced, uh, that can be uh, uttered, whereas personal knowledge is related to identity, to origins, biographies, personal preferences, curiosity. Uh, personal knowledge is much more uh, is much less standardized, uh, let's, uh, uh, let's say. And it's related to other categories, categories like, like love, passion, desire, pleasure, uh, rather than profession. And this reminds me uh, the very interesting uh, uh, description that Antoine Aignan, who is a sociologist of science, does of the amateurs in the French sense. An amateur in French sense is not uh, bad. That's not a bad thing. In English, it has a bad connotation. In French, it has a rather positive connotation. An amateur is a connoisseur, uh, and connoisseur comes from connoisseur. Uh, in, uh, in, in French, and Aignan shows that uh, the taste is built, he's interested in music, but he has worked on wine too, and he shows that the taste is, is built um, uh, over the years by investing 
time, by investing money, uh, by buying books, and by practicing. It's a constant learning, but it's not uh, related to uh, often to any formal uh, training. So you, we, we get through, I would say, a detailed analysis of uh, these the sequences to uh, uh, the possibility of pinpointing these different uh, types uh, of epistemic uh, uh, categories. Uh, in, in a cheese shop uh, in Madrid, the, uh, the salesperson says, estamos intentando hay poco culturizar a la gente, culturizar. We, basically, he, he theorizes the fact that the cheese shop is a locus of socialization. And I think it is, it is interesting to look at uh, a, a gourmet shop in this way, because uh, you see that the issue is not just learning something, is not just acquiring knowledge, but you have a lot of different issues that uh, are, uh, are, are, are intertwined. You have economic interests, you have identity challenges, you have uh, a sense of professionality, but also a sense of service, and you can have uh, uh, contradictory rights and obligations going, uh, going on. Uh, you have the respect of the customer, but at the same time, uh, the uh, necessity sometimes, like the Copenhagen lady, uh, to correct uh, the, uh, the customer. So you have a lot of possible dilemmas uh, that, uh, that emerge in, uh, in this way. So I hope I was able to show that the shop the cheese shop can be seen as a perspicuous locus for reflecting on issues of situated intersubjective, discursive, and embodied knowledge. It's a highly specific setting, but uh, I think it reveals with particular clarity epistemic issues in their complexity, uh, but this complexity doesn't uh, um, make impossible to uh, show their systematic uh, organization. And I think that globally this teaches us the importance of considering the way in which the participants themselves treat knowledge, define knowledge, recognize knowledge and attribute uh, knowledge, as well as the social, moral and interactional consequences of those uh, local epistemic configurations for uh, the next actions. I thank you. Okay, we have uh, 20 minutes uh, before us. Are there any questions? Yes, uh, Baruch Schwartz over there. Uh, uh, thank you for this uh, very interesting uh, uh, presentation, a uh, keynote. Um, uh, you said that uh, tasting is a, is a social and intersubjective activity, but uh, I have a feeling that uh, um, your your way to uh, to uh, define tasting here is is uh, completely uh, um, connected to the particular context in which uh, it happened. That is to say, that it is uh, in a cheese shop with a vendor and with. Uh, with clients, with people who want to, uh, to, 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 to buy cheese. And uh, I, I think about, uh, you know, a, a, another possibility. Uh, for example, the, the well-known uh, uh, Marcel Proust uh, who is tasting his Madeleine when he is in a restaurant, and uh, in which uh, he, takes, he takes in his spoon the, the, the cake, and uh, nobody is there, and uh, he has... Uh, uh, he has an intra-subjective uh, subjective, uh, experience. Of course, after that, he will uh, speak about that in his romance. But uh, in fact, in this context, it's, it is something which is uh, totally different. So I, I have a feeling here that uh, more than uh, speaking about uh, tasting, 
uh, it is any, any action in a particular context in which there are two people, one who wants to buy and the other one who wants to, 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 to sell. So the tasting here is put in this context and then it is social and it is inter intersubjective. Mm -hmm. But in another context it will be very different. So I thank you for the for the for the question. I I, I totally I think almost totally <laughs> agree with you in the sense that um, precisely the, the the idea to socialize taste and to socialize sensations in in general is is precisely the idea to embed them in a context and to embed them in a context for me means to embed them in the activities in which they uh, they happen. Um, and this raises an, an interesting, an interesting issue. Here, I have, I have shown you uh, one, uh, one activity and one context. Uh, I'm doing that uh, in in a variety of uh, of contexts that go from uh, uh, upper end restaurants to container diving uh, of people going in uh, in the waste and and uh, uh, picking up uh, food. Uh, so I, I'm looking at a variety of, uh, uh, of contexts pre precisely to understand if there are uh, some, some kinds of, um, of regularities uh, related to the, uh, this intersubjective organization of, uh, of tasting. And actually what, uh, what appears is that both um, uh, these, uh, um, these practices of tasting are very differently organized because the stake uh, is very different. Here the issue is to understand if they want to buy or not to buy, uh, basically. Uh, so basically there are two possibilities. And they don't engage uh, in very sophisticated descriptions uh, of the cheese. I have amateurs uh, doing beer tasting uh, that I've wor I'm working on. They, they have no ideas about the beers, but because the activity is an activity of tasting, they produce outcomes that are adjectives, metaphors, comparisons, all things that I absolutely don't have in the, in the cheese shop. Interestingly, they do nonetheless something very similar, that is this, this, this alternance of moments of withdrawal from, uh, from talk and from mutual gaze, and then moments of re-engagement. So this seems to be a characteristic of, uh, uh, of tasting as a social, this social individual but nonetheless public activity. Now to come back to, to Marcel Proust, um, the thing with, uh, with Proust is that first of all he's alone when he does this, uh, this experience and I'm not sure that when, but I don't have any video, I would love to have the video of Marcel putting the Madeleine in his, uh, his mouth. I don't have the video so I cannot speak and I should stop speaking now. <laughs> but um, uh, I suspect uh, that what he does is that when he puts the madeleine in his mouth, he's not doing a tasting. He's just eating the madeleine. And that's a very different thing. Uh, I, I, uh, one of my, my points here is that when you, when you taste, you, you, you really focus, you, you focus your attention and your sensorial attention on what, on what you are doing. That's why they don't speak. And I think, I suppose that, that uh, what, what Marcel does at that moment is that he is eating the, the Madeleine and suddenly uh, something, something happens. And I don't know what happens. And this, of course, is, is related to the sense of taste. But it's tasting in a very different sense than, uh, I think, the other occasions that, that I am describing. And I, I don't say that to say that uh, uh, this, this is not interesting. Uh, but it, it, um, it prompts extra reflections about how to define uh, this, this, this practice. Uh, and the conditions of, uh, of this practice. I hope I have provided for some answers. Okay, are there other questions? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I will, oh, 
Hi, I'm Christy Boyer. I'm a computer scientist from the University of Florida. Hi. In studying dialogues for learning, one of the things that we notice is people try to uh, sort of establish social status, their own, or help others to keep it. And I noticed in your excerpt about the Brie, it seemed like the expert might have been trying some politeness strategies toward the customer and saying that thing was not a Brie, but it was actually very similar. And I wonder if you could comment on the role that politeness or trying to help save each other's status plays in communicating knowledge in your observations. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for the, the, the question. And uh, that example is, is quite nice in this, uh, in this respect. I, I, uh, I totally agree. Um, I don't work so much on uh, issues of politeness. That is, I don't use that that language, but I'm very interested in, in issues of uh, rights and obligations uh, and how the, the participants engage in what they, they are doing. And I think that this completely converges with your, uh, your observations in, in the sense that, and that's why also I think that it's interesting to look at uh, things like, uh, like, like uh, yeah, these epistemic uh, um, activities in in context and in context where where there is i suppose there is almost never pure knowledge going on but there are other things and here uh, i think it's a it's a nice example and i think you 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 must have that in your data too where you you have competing uh, competing um aspects uh, uh, you you have a, a, a customer who says something that is clearly um, wrong and so this opens for a slot in the next, uh, uh, for the next action, a possibility to correct. But correction would be in service of representing knowledge or a certain version, uh, epistemic version, but it would run, in this case, clearly it runs against a sense of service. So, so you, you, you have, as an expert, the, the, the salesperson has the right and maybe the obligation to tell, to correct the client, but as a person who is serving another person, or even as a person who is trying to sell something to the other person, uh, uh, probably there is another kind uh, of, uh, uh, of obligation or of orientation. And I think that it, what is interesting is that in the format of the term, you see those competing aspects uh, where at some point you have a slight pause, so where you can, you can imagine that the possible next actions are, are kind of evaluated, and then you have a correction that is, but that, that is followed by something like a minimization of the problem which is addressing both, uh, both aspects. So I think that we, 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 it's possible to track these competing uh, uh, interests, orientations, rights, and obligations within the, the details of the, the, the format of the term. Okay, there's another question just here, just behind here. Ah, okay. <laughs> it's already done. That's okay. So my name is Yotam from the University of Haifa. Um, you talked, uh, first of all, I like your conceptualization and the fine-grained methodology you use very much. Um, you talked about consequentiality, um, but you mm -hmm. talked about in a context of, of the cheese shop, and I know it's, that could be very consequential for many people, particularly the French, but, um, <laughs> but I guess my question is, um, you know, I'm interested very much in like consequentiality to promote meaningful transformational change, let's say in students, or even I think many people are interested in um, the uh, consequentiality across maybe broader social levels, uh, issues of power and equity, things like that. So I'm curious how you might be able to use your type of analysis and inform those types of, uh, that, those of contexts. Mm. So, um, Consequentiality is, is generally used in conversation analysis at the level of the uh, next actions. Uh, and um, I, I, w one of the aims that I, I had in this talk was to, of course I was working on a, on a specific setting because that's how we work, but that I was showing you the, the kind of combinatorial 
uh, uh, set of variations that you can have, and 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 to show that if you if you engage in 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 a, in a certain trajectory of action, uh, you might have these these options uh, which are not uh, they are not random they they are not infinite. Uh, basically, you you have uh, at each step uh, a series of of options, and I think that these. This can be something that that uh, that you can uh, you can look at exactly in the same way in a, in a classroom in a in a you know in a in a workshop in a brainstorming place or whatever. Uh, uh, it's it's really the method uh, that that allows you to do these kind of things. Um, so in, in that sense, the consequentiality is looking at not only the next action, but maybe the next of the next. So how actions then respond to each other. I think it is very important to first of all, well, I, I speak from my perspective, of course, to first of all look at that because uh, that's where you understand already quite a lot of things. And for me, social change or uh, epistemic change begins there. Uh, so if if there is any change, uh, the next actions should show you that. Um, and I would I would like to invite you to, to pay attention to that. Then the question that you ask is 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 then the second part, which is much more difficult to to answer, which is how to uh, and how to honestly uh, go from that level. Uh, to a more uh, a more general uh, or a more another type of temporality, uh, I would say that's that's what I uh, I, uh, I understand, and I I, I don't have a, um, a, a precise response in the sense when you have this. It means that three years after she will remember what Abria Savara is. I don't know. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, I, I cannot extrapolate. But I, 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 I see how I could do it uh, uh, by uh, creating the possibility of getting data that would uh, document the same activities, uh, maybe X. Uh, one month later, six months later, uh, and and try to and try to build uh, that in a in a for example in a longitudinal way. Um, there are currently some very interesting discussions within the field of uh, ethno CA uh, about longitudinal uh, analysis, uh, and I, I can uh, there is a there is a book that just came out by Simona Pekarek Döhler. Um, uh, Martinez Gonzalez and Wagner on on longitudinal analysis in this uh, in this field, and I have a paper on historical analysis in this uh, in this perspective. It's very hard to do that in with this kind of of methodology, but I would say it's interestingly possible. Uh, so I invite you to to read the book <laughs> about that. Yeah. Okay, so. Hi. Oh, turned on. Uh, hi there, my name's Janet Kolodner. I'm from Boston College. Um, so uh, I was thinking that a lot of what you were talking about with respect to tasting, you know, and to the discussion around it, really bears a lot of resemblance to the kinds of discussions we have here at the conference about various nuances in understanding different things, right? And um, you already said something about tasting in uh, response to Baruch. Mm -hmm. but, um, but I guess what I'm wondering about is something else. You talked about, uh, so, so I mean, my example of tasting here would be having just looked at some videos and discussing some things going on in the videos, right? Uh, giving that attention to it in the same way. But, but my question has to do with experts versus amateur connoisseurs. Right, because when I'm having that discussion with somebody, or anybody's having those kinds of discussions here, there, most, many of us, most of us, I don't know how to say it, would consider ourselves experts in the learning sciences, okay? But still, we have these discussions with somebody else where they know something more about something, and like, I'm, when I'm having this discussion about those videos, um, with uh, Joshua Danish, for example, who I was talking to this morning, 
he's the expert at whatever that thing is, and I'm the amateur connoisseur. So I, I don't know what's important about making that distinction, distinction, and if it's, I don't know what's important about making that distinction. Uh, um, I, uh, I, I don't know for the, the kind of situation that you are alluding to. I think that for the kind of setting that you are um, referring to, what, uh, what this setting shows is the, the, the importance of having what we call an emic vision of what knowledge is. That is not an, a, a vision that is defined uh, by some standards or some predefined uh, models, but a vision that try to reconstruct what participants consider as being knowledge and what or who participants consider to be knowledgeable. Um, and starting from that perspective, uh, also paying attention to the way in which this is constantly adjusted, because as you said, you might be uh, more knowledgeable about something, but uh, your uh, partner can be knowledgeable about other things. And what happens in our, in all community, in all scientific communities, is that you are constantly also um, calibrating, but also assessing what the other is knowing or not knowing, or knowing better or knowing less than than you. So it's it's uh, the the game of the scientific community is 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 that one, uh, and we are constantly doing uh, doing it. So it shows the interest of uh, of of looking at what what happens moment by moment and in the responses. So it's not that X knows something about video that you don't know. Is is that you attribute X that kind of epistemic superiority and, and X uh, accepts it, uh, for example. But there are other games that you could, uh, you could play. Uh, so this, this shows the, 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 the interest of, uh, of those fine-grained negotiations and definitions and redefinitions. Then the fact that this relates to categories is, I think, another, uh, another issue. Uh, and categories um, are always, because categories tend always to reify some, uh, some kind of, uh, of statuses. And I think that in some cases th there are categories at play, but in some other cases uh, it's, it's more this, this fine-grained adjustment that, that, is, uh, that is going on. So I'm, I'm not claiming that the, 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 the distinction between connoisseur and, and, and expert, for example, plays, uh, plays a role in systematically in all, all contexts. I would, not, I would not claim that. And I'm myself trying to understand how this, how this works. Uh, and I think that in the, in, the, in the domain of sensoriality, it seems to, uh, to work in certain, uh, in certain ways. Okay, yeah. um, I think we have time for just two final questions. Mm -hmm. There's one up there and then... Yeah, so uh, my question is uh, related to uh, the distinction of producing and consuming. In the sense, uh, tasting is, uh, is passive in the sense like I'm consuming the product which is directly available uh, as against, say, me myself involved in the production of, uh, say, cheese in your case, like when I'm cooking something in the case of a restaurant. And it's nice that you brought out the uh, case of food as an example. Like if you look at uh, learning in the context of STEM, education. So these days there have been a lot of discussions around making and tinkering in connection to developing embodied understanding about various uh, concepts, abstract concepts in science and mathematics. So what's the role of actively involving in the production of something as against just consuming. Yeah. Thank you. That's, uh, that's interesting. Um, uh, I'm currently working on cooks. Uh, so this, this is a case where you have producers <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, and then you have people who eat what the cook has uh, produced. And it, it's, it's true that um, uh, it's, it's interesting to uh, for example, see the, 
the gaze that the cook has on the customer who is eating um, as if what the customer will say about the food will be a kind of sentence or a kind of uh, sanction of what the cook is. So there is, uh, there is a relation uh, between the, uh, the identity of the producer and the object uh, that uh, uh, he or she produces and the way in which it is consumed. Um, and I think that in, in, in most of the cases in our analysis, we, we constantly have to, to deal with uh, producers and consumers, but you, we don't have them uh, one in front of the other. One. We don't have them face to face. Uh, in, 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 in some cases, like gastronomy, you might have them in face to face, and uh, uh, to observe what, what happens in that case can be quite, quite interesting. I don't know if I responded to what you were, you had in mind with, uh, with your question, but I, I definitely think that um, to, to look at uh, production and consumption uh, and, and issues related to responsibility, ownership, uh, uh, proud, uh, but also yeah, responsibility, um, in these cases, it's very, very interesting. Okay, uh, we have the last question over here. Thanks. Hi. Uh, on a lighter note, I'm a project from Copenhagen. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what to <laughs> Anyway, uh, that was supposed to be a joke. Uh, <laughs> Fantastisk! <laughs> uh, tak. Um, no, I, I was just thinking about the power structure associated with expertise and novicehood. Uh, and uh, I was wondering, your sample, rather, at least the sample that you presented, uh, was rather uh, in, including nice and very patient salespeople. Uh, uh, but I was, I mean, and it's interesting that you say that uh, a claim about knowledge that I don't know, saying that would initiate some interaction. Uh, whereas I was thinking about the other, other, way, uh, other scenario and completely opposite that it would actually kill, this, kill the interaction completely. Uh, for instance, you know, go to a shop, especially at the end of the day, the salesperson is tired and you say, I don't know about that. And that person says, go to another shop. Uh, have you come across any such instances and uh, how do you sort of look at them from an analytic point of view? Uh, well, um, first of all, I, I must say that, that um, uh, this kind of shop, you're, you're right, this kind of shop is, is very strange in terms of how they allocate the time to the customers. We have a lot of professions that are organizing themselves. I think about medicine, for example, medical consultations. In history, you have the, the length of medical consultations that is going, uh, that is, 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 is being shortened again and again. Uh, in shop, in cheese shops is very strange. Apparently, they take quite an, an enormous time, even for a, a, a little uh, kind of purchase. So there is, there is something that myself, I, I, I ask my, to myself, is the, the, what kind of economy of time they have. And, and it's not an, an evident uh, economy of time. It doesn't correlate with, uh, with money, uh, for example. That's interesting because it shows that there are places in our economy that, that are bound to other kinds of values, symbolic values, uh, uh, for example, which is, I think, interesting for, for a reflection about what is value, economic value, for example. Um, now, in, in, uh, in, in, of course, all, all, the inf all the interactions can, can begin and, 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 and terminate immediately. Uh, uh, and this is, this is a possibility. Uh, actually, I don't have them um, in, uh, in, my, uh, in, in, my, in my data. Uh, this will not be a big problem for me analytically. Uh, they would be interesting in terms of, uh, of service, uh, for example. And I've been interested in, in what is to, be, to show that you are available and uh, what is to show service. I, I'm quite interested in those uh, in those aspects, and this can be done in a in a quite in a quite subtle uh, subtle way. The example you you you, you give is is the, the extreme opposite. Uh, 
Um, but but in itself is you know it's it's not a problem and it, it will take much less time to analyze these kind of interactions than the ones that I spend hours and hours uh, on a few on a few seconds. <laughs> thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much.